You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts on Netroots Radio or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for November 12th, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we are not kidding, every week is Infrastructure Week. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. So true. It is Illinois true. has so much infrastructure going on. Every time we drive someplace or walk someplace or or skip to my loo someplace or mm-hmm. go through a park or go out at night on, on our little ninja tours and see a street torn up or sewer pipes up on the up on the sidewalk being replaced we look at each other and nod and say infrastructure 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 yeah what's the delay why is that it's infrastructure Don't why is this worry. It's, it's just infrastructure, infrastructure. calm down and, and governor it's pritzker's doing okay on the soft infrastructure too he is uh we filled out our um healthcare.gov application this week and junior by we, dude by we we mean my wife did all the hard work i did yes <laughs> all the heavy lifting and all the income estimation which is very hard to do <laughs> when you're surviving on paypal and patreon donations mm-hmm. one month at a time but that's okay i mean okay. you average it out and you work it out and they they assume that if you have that kind of tax return that you are estimating. So, well, and, and I do gotten, pretty well at estimating. So we've gotten a few notes from the IRS saying you're a Midwest liberal podcasting. How, how is there any money at all? Why, why are you, <laughs> are you kidding me? Oh, they've tried to charge us twice for our income because yes, they have mm-hmm. podcast, you know, the PayPal's in my name and then the podcast is in the podcast name. And I've got yeah. that switched over. It's a long, long saga, but lawyers were involved. And- I always, <laughs> I always just with the IRS take a deep breath and realize I want to pay my taxes. I want to pay what I owe Mm -hmm. and work with them and it'll work out. Well, Uh, but I I did fill out my application for healthcare.gov and I encourage everybody to do that. If you're looking for health, if you don't get your health insurance through your employer Mm -hmm. um, and you think, Oh, it's not going to make any difference uh, this year versus years ago or it's going to be too expensive that the subsidies go on for another year at least and knock wood with build back better we get build back better by you know a year from now at some point yes yeah i mean i i think right now i i really have been likening it to knitting a baby sweater (laughs) this whole process of getting the biden agenda passed because it takes time and it's too long and you get tired of it and mm-hmm. finally it's done and then you put it, you know, and you move on to the next thing. That's right. Mm-hmm. But it takes patience. It takes a lot of patience. And um, anyway, I am grateful that our health care premiums for the next year are affordable. Yeah. But Junior Dude, who was put onto my insurance, our insurance, in the middle of the year last year because Mm -hmm. he left college. And he had college insurance, and then that dropped. And so what they do is add you to, add him to his parents' policy. But now, um, because he's a single person still filing his own tax return, but living at home and not with a lot of income because Mm -hmm. he's planning to go back to school in January, um, they put him on Medicaid. And that is really good coverage in Illinois, as far as I'm concerned. It can be hard to find uh, a doctor, um, a specialist, and or a dentist at that point, especially mm-hmm. dentists. Um, but apart from that, the coverage is really good for prescriptions and everything else. So um, grateful for that. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you want to talk about the mail that we got this week? Do you want to start off with that? Thanking our listener. Yeah. Um, we got a lot of good mail this week. We did. Um, and, and, and we had a visit from a listener and it's just, it's been nice. It's been a nice yeah. week or so. Um, I got a lovely little, I don't know if it's a sculpture or a paperweight or paper knickknack. Weight. Yeah. That <laughs> cracked me up. That was like, this is great. This is just great. Um, from a friend of ours. And, um, 
got a describe lovely. Describe it. Go ahead and describe it. Uh, it's a it's an upright elephant with little X's over its eyes. It says R I P across the chest. Yeah. And it's from R I P G O P. Yeah, right? it's not from last year. This uh-huh. is from you know decades ago. Yes. And he'd had it around and thought I might like it, and he was right, and I do, and oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, and I got a lovely hand drawn birthday card, uh, featuring me from the neck down. Uh, taking a Voight comp test, which I thought was <laughs> adorable. And I will I will scan that and put it on my blog at some point. And some kind soul, in addition to all the other cool things and uh, a couple of checks and some stuff that came in for which I owe everyone thank you notes, um, some kind soul uh, decided our home would be a good place for his well-worn Blu-ray of the entire series of the Rockford Files. Oh my gosh, what a yes, perfect indeed. gift for you, Drift Glass. Oh my God, because we, you know, we love the Rockford Files. It mm-hmm. ages really well. And I think we only made it through about half of them before they started playing musical networks on us. And we sort of lost where they are. So this way I can put them on anytime I want. And he sent a lovely letter. This is from Steve. And Steve hopes I have a Blu-ray player. I do. If not, they're pretty cheap. Yes, they are. It's nice to be able to watch an episode without Empire Carpet or Have You Been Injured commercials, which, you know, there's there's some argument to be made for the joy of crappy local commercials from the 70s, which I thoroughly enjoy. Um, I will miss Burt Weinman, your TV Ford man, for example. <clears throat> the show is so well done, coming up on 50 years old, and it still fits today. Sure, there are lines in the script that would not be written today, but overall, it could play in prime time today. The regular characters are great, and the endless guest stars are fun to see early in their careers. It was ahead of its time and even foreshadowed issues we're dealing with today. One of the cool things about um, the Rockford Files, the many cool things, is, this is me as an aside, It young David Chase worked on the Rockford Files. David Chase went on to create the the Sopranos. (laughs) And that lineage, learning your craft, learning your craft from professionals, apprenticing... And being good at it and being encouraged in it and then coming up 20 years later with something amazing uh, is is how great art gets done. It doesn't get done spontaneously. It takes, you know, 10,000 hours of practice. Mm-hmm. James Garner is one of my favorites. Letter continues. He blurred the line between the actor and his wise ass, take no shit character of Rockford. The actor consistently fought the greedy meat grinder studio and frequently won. I think after the series was long over and lawsuits were settled, both sides, sorry to use that term, wish they'd done things differently to keep the great thing going. I think that's why we did get a few reunion TV movie episodes, which I watched, but prefer to remember things as left in the original six seasons. James Garner was temperamental during the series, which is probably due to chronic pain from being forced to work through his injuries. Yeah, he was hurt badly uh, in his military service. I think he had one possibly two purple hearts i'm not sure but he mm-hmm. was he was a, a meddled um warrior by the mm-hmm. way uh happy veterans day to all of the veterans out there uh he was also somewhat complex an animal lover whose estate still donates to shelters but also did beef it's what's for dinner commercials a handsome guy who starred as a male model who started as a male model but hated any kind of sex symbol reference or romantic scenes anyway i hope you and blue gal enjoy i enjoyed the podcast you have both been such soothing voices while commenting on the most horrible shit that happened during the week. I often replay episodes to fall asleep to. And you know what, Steve? If we can bore you to sleep, we've done our job. <laughs> Thank it's you amazing again. how many people listen to us the second time before yeah. bed. Yes. <laughs> and that just increases our download, which means our ad rates for our fake ads go oh, for our fake way ad. up. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, I had a lovely birthday. It, it was eventful in ways that I did not anticipate due to uh, things we've already talked about on this yeah. podcast. But thank you all. And thank you. Notes will be coming out to all the individual folks as soon as I get off my lazy ass. And Well, and we're one of the few podcasts that does try to remember our listeners in, in thank you notes, I have to say. Oh, I don't from know. what I've heard from our listeners who donate to other podcasts um also we should say um one exchange that happened with the listener that we had coffee with this week um you said to him you know i realized that we're the liberal media we're looking for yeah the i hate to break it to you is it this you is know, it us and a few others are the liberal media are the liberal media and he looked at you and said well that makes me george soros <laughs> And we laughed and laughed. We laughed and laughed. Uh-huh. Um, I want to start off with something funny. 
Okay. Um, because the Republican Senate primaries are going to be lit. Oh, yeah, baby. Yeah. There was an article in Daily Coast this week about how poor, poor Mitch McConnell is having a problem finding sane Republicans to run for U.S. Senate seats around the country. I don't know. Maybe maybe Joe Manchin's interested. No, it, it is turning into another 2010 where, mm-hmm. you know, it is easy as I said at Crooks and Liars, it's easy to find someone to run in a house seat that's heavily gerrymandered, and you can put wackadoodle Marjorie yeah. Taylor Greene in there, and yeah. she'll rile up the primary voters, and then they'll turn out in November, and you've got yourself a house seat. And it's very possible that the Republican Party will take the house in 2022. I don't want mm-hmm. that to happen. I'm going to nope. fight for that not to happen. Mm-hmm. But because of gerrymandering and because of the way our media works, it may happen. Mm-hmm. And on the other hand, as we remember from 2010, because we're liberals and liberals remember stuff, mm. <laughs> that was the year of I am not a witch, right. 2010, right. and Christine O'Donnell in Connecticut, and also Sharon Angle in Nevada against Harry Reid, and you know the, her Second Amendment solutions. And the the Republican Party had an opportunity to take the Senate and they didn't do it Mm -hmm. because they could not find uh, people who to win their primaries who weren't crazy. Well, on the other hand, you did have a sober minded person like Carly Fiorina running her (laughs) demon sheep ad with with the red glowing eyes. So, you know, she wasn't going to win California. I mean, that was that wasn't going to happen. But. The Nevada and the Connecticut races were were supposed to be somewhat of an issue. Yeah. Um, or, you know, competitive, so to speak. Uh-huh. And so Mitch McConnell's looking around and uh, Sununu, who is John Sununu's son, who's apparently a popular governor in New Hampshire, uh, said, no, I'm not running for the Senate. And that, to, to many minds, as I've been reading up on this, is as much a bellwether as Virginia ever could be, the Virginia yeah. governor's race. Because if Mitch McConnell can't find stable people who will stay on message... You mean like Herschel Walker? ...during a general election... Uh-huh. Uh, he's in trouble. He's going to remain in the minority. So, um, But one of the people running for the U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania um, uh-huh. is named Sean Parnell... Yeah, And he is following exactly this uh, mold of being on Fox News and being a loudmouth on Fox News. And that gives you a leg up in Republican primaries. Mm-hmm. Name recognition, uh, you know, free advertising by just being on shows. And the problem is that because he's been on Fox being a loudmouth, there's digital video evidence of his loudmouth behavior. And a group called Accountable GOP uh, found his appearance on Fox Nation, where uh, he made these three quotes. I feel like the whole happy wife, happy life nonsense has done nothing but raise one generation of woman tyrants after the next. Maybe it's just that now there's an entire generation of men that don't want to put up with the BS of a high maintenance narcissistic woman. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Man, just just how can you resist that? How can and, how and can the you money, resist that? The money kind of quote, Drift Glass, gotta go with mm-hmm. the money quote here, especially if you started out this way. From an evolutionary standpoint. <laughs> right. So true. From an evolutionary standpoint, it used to be, you know, women were attracted to your strength because you could defend them uh-huh. from dinosaurs. That's right, man. Dinosaurs were coming for the chicks all the time. And then you get and out I there said, with your baseball bat. Dinosaurs, look in the mirror, Sean. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's something. I mean, it, and I don't. And it's this is an impenetrable and an impossible question to answer: whether they mm-hmm. really are this stupid, or they realize that if they have to act this stupid because the base is this stupid, and they don't want to seem highfalutin uh, and get themselves crosswise with a bunch of morons who are their voters. And so well, that if if you were if we're going to go there, we have to dovetail that right into the NRA tapes that came out. this. Oh, week. yeah, you should do that. Go right ahead. The, the NRA tapes were taken out. Uh, NPR released 
audio recordings of um, NRA lobbyists and Charlton Heston <laughs> talking uh, right after Columbine about what to do. Do we pay a million dollars to gun victims, mass shooting victims? No, that's admitting guilt, right. and we can't right. do that. And it really was a political strategy meeting about yeah. what to do when our product, the product of our donors, the product that we promote for money, kills a bunch of people at once, and particularly yeah. kids. And they came up with a plan that worked. You know, it now is not the time to debate political, to politicize the deaths of young people. No. You know, now is not the time. And uh, we blame the press for always making these in these unfortunate incidents into a ratings bonanza. Sure. And we're not going to contribute to that. And that was there. That was the NRA's modus operandi for the from then on. Yeah. Until they went bankrupt. <laughs> and not only morally, which they had always been, but mm -hmm. financially. Mm -hmm. uh, but these tapes of these, you know, lobbyists and political experts talking about how do we handle the PR from children dying from our products and from our donors' products. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that just like the, you know, the NRA and the Republican Party have so much in common. Yeah, they're, well, they're, they're the same part. It's the they same They are group. the same. Yeah. But these, it was very telling to listen to these lobbyists. And there's one named Marion Hammer, who is a major NRA lobbyist. And she said, look, we have a wacko problem mm -hmm. in our membership. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about what to do because the week after Columbine was the NRA convention. One week. And that was the convention where Charlton Heston held up his rifle and said, over my cold, dead hand, cold, you know, out of my dead cold, dead hands, hands you'll take mm -hmm. this rifle away from me mm -hmm. and doubled down. And they had more protesters outside the NRA convention than they had inside. Uh, but they held firm to their, you know, plan, mm -hmm. which was mm -hmm. we're not going to politicize the deaths of the unfortunate deaths of, of young people. And. <laughs> So the, the question was, do we cancel the convention? That's what they were talking about on the tapes. Mm -hmm. And Marion Hammer, major NRA lobbyist, said this, quote, if you pull down the exhibit hall, that's not going to leave anything for the media except the members meeting. And you're going to have the wackos with all kinds of crazy resolutions, with all kinds of, of dressing like a bunch of hillbillies and idiots. And it's gonna, it's gonna be the worst thing you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So it is better to have the exhibit hall with the gun displays up. Right. Because that will keep the wackos busy while we hold our business meeting. That was the strategy going into that convention. Mm -hmm. And as I wrote in my post at Crooks and Liars about this, I'm old enough to remember when Fox News hosted Karl Rove advising Donald Trump to disavow QAnon. Mm -hmm. That was August of last year. 2020. Yep. That was 15 months ago. Mm -hmm. And now it's too late. Well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's too late. It's been too late. It's been too late yeah. for a very long time. And, yeah. and as, as we have repeatedly said, um, you guys on the right built a doomsday machine with no off switch. Right. Mm -hmm. And you didn't care because nothing bad was ever going to happen to you. Right. This wasn't right. going to run out of control. All you needed was these people's votes and their mm -hmm. money and their eyeballs. And, when election time came, you need them to go to the polls and vote as they're told. It was clear where this was headed. And yet all of the right was perfectly content to go along with it, ignore all the warnings, call the people who were warning them lunatics because we were all liberals, right? Liberals can't be trusted. The New York Times can't be trusted. Nobody can be trusted but Fox News and hate radio. Mm -hmm. And this is where we were going this whole fucking time. And the part that is most maddening is now people like Stuart Stevens are willing to say, yeah, it was all a lie. It's all a lie. Title of his book, All a Lie. And occasionally you'll hear some never Trump person, usually with a big podcast uh, or a medium sized podcast, say, Yeah, yeah, you know, it was all a lie. <laughs> yeah. We, we can't, you know, we, we knew we had this problem. We knew these people were in our midst. We, we just didn't, we didn't want to believe how bad it was. Right. Well, and that's what I said in my post about the NRA, which is every conservative movement is yeah. a privately acknowledged scam against ignorant extremists. Exactly. Exactly. Except and that now they've got guns and they're violent and they want 
quick solutions to their frustration well, that and, you've planted in them. And they're 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 violent, they're stupid, they're brainwashed, and you've taught them. Mm-hmm. This again, I'm gonna repeat something from Failsafe, the movie, which is where Henry Fonda's on the on the radio with a pilot who's going to bomb Moscow. Mm-hmm. And that will cause World War Three. And he's ordering the pilot not to do this. And the pilot's saying, You are telling me to do something you specifically trained me not to do. Mm-hmm. You, Charlie Sykes. I'm talking to you, Charlie. I'm talking to you, Joe Scarborough. I'm talking to all of you assholes who now think you know best how to run the Democratic Party. You train these people not to listen to anyone who tells them anything they don't want to hear. How did you think this was going to end? I I admire Stuart Stevens for saying this out loud, but the cowardice of people like Charlie Sykes and the cowardice of Joe Scarborough who don't want to take any responsibility for any of this, who want to shrug their shoulders and say, well, it all happened after I left. Is, is just sickening. The fact that these people have giant public platforms still, the fact that these people went from hating the left to telling the left how it should run everything and keeping their contempt for the left intact. Mm-hmm. You know, I listened to hundreds of, of these podcasts over the years. And the one consistent fact, those two consistent factors, one, Trump's insane. Two, we had nothing to do with this. <laughs> And three, the left is almost as bad as the right. And really, if you keep listening to crazy leftists, you're going to destroy democracy. It'll be your goddamn fault. And never but, mind that Joe Scarborough spent Christmases at Mar-a-Lago no. with his buddy Donald Trump through 2014. Well, and yeah. that that brings us to the and messaging. Had Trump on his show as a call-in yeah. once a month on a regular schedule through the campaign. Well, and, and it, it's so... And this is the part where, you know, this is all on tape, right? It doesn't matter to these people. It doesn't Mm -hmm. matter. It doesn't Mm -hmm. matter because they'll never hear it because they live in a bubble where none of this ever gets through, which brings us, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to the messaging problem, to the messaging problem. Mm -hmm. Um, There are, I went to a community meeting this morning of concerned uh, neighborhood people and businesses and uh, they're delightful people. And there was a lovely presentation on a strategy for bringing businesses in and retaining them and so on and so forth. Because you're and a community activist. I'm a community activist. Yeah, in my heart of hearts, wherever I live, I want it, I want it to be a great place for me and my neighbors to live in. I want everyone to be happy and prosperous here. And honestly, and it was a fine presentation, and the guy was good, and the, I knew all the people there. So, but as happens in such meetings, especially when there's you know a few liberals in the audience, a few <laughs> aging hippies in the audience, it went from a very specific kind of question about um, zoning and and tactics and so on to Human nature. Isn't it weird? <laughs> um, and one of the things that a, a, a friend of mine that, that we both know, um, who does voiceover work locally, oddly mm-hmm. enough, um, said, you know, here's the thing. It used to be we had television, we had radio and, t- and, and the newspaper. And you could get all these really wonderful community messages and all this, these really wonderful resources out to people using one of those three things. Everybody read the newspaper. Everybody listened to the radio more or less, local radio especially. And there was local TV. And if you wanted to tell people about the, the the Christmas walk or grants for your business, you could just plug it into that system and off it would go. However, everything is fractionated now. Everything is 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 microcast to just a small group of people. And yet we have all this, this need to communicate this very important information to a large group of diverse people in our community. How do we do that? That, in, in sum, is exactly the problem with Democrats' messaging. It's not the vocabulary Democrats are using. I have listened to dozens of conservative uh, allies shitting all over Democrats. You know, it's a really a messaging problem, Blue Cat. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe, and Charlie Sykes is the fucking worst at this. You know, I, I, the problem is Democrats don't know how to talk to normal people. They don't know how oh, to normal talk to rural is the voters. New word. Via yeah. Axios, oh. normal Democrats, they want to call themselves normal if they're not the squad. Right. Don't pay attention to any of that bullshit. No. Number one, that is right wingers trying to tell Democrat, fr- trying to discourage and demoralize Democrats for a midterm election. Yes. Secondly, if you see a Democratic congressperson um, attempting to use those words, they're just trying to save their seat. And when they get that seat, they're going to vote the way <laughs> Nancy Pelosi tells yes. them to vote. Yes, they are. So God that bless doesn't... them. Go with God. Whatever you need to say, whatever you think, whatever your, you know, $600,000 a week political consultants tell you you need to say to keep your purple district, whatever, do it. Do whatever. 
Yeah, Nancy Pelosi's fine with you calling her, you know, too liberal, a, a running dog. Normal. If you ha- if that gets you elected, that's fine. Right. Do what you got to do. Then you're going to gonna vote with with the caucus on what the caucuses, you know, she, Nancy Pelosi doesn't put anything on the floor unless her caucus votes 100% more or less for it with right. very few outliers. Well, she has the votes or she has the votes to pass. Yeah. It. Yeah. She's not going to put yeah. it out there. So, and when you watch as I do our never Trump allies in the media, I, you watch them seamlessly swap back and forth between two messages that are diametrically opposed. First, they will scream when confronted with the insanity of their former or soon to be former party, mm-hmm. they will say, Oh my God, the GOP base are brain dead zombies. And how did that happen? <laughs> Okay. All right. Let's let's hold on that for a moment. Yes, the problem, the, the reason Republican politicians are so dangerous and 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 irresponsible and anti democratic and racist is because the base loves it that way. So yes, the Republican base are a bunch of fucking brain dead bigots and imbeciles. We agree on that. They immediately switch over to, oh my God, Democrats suck at messaging to the GOP base. Okay, because Why? their sub zero wine cooler refrigerator was paid for. By knowing how to cater to the crazy wingnut Republican base. Right. And and, and, you should... and their job now is to demoralize Democrats for the midterms. Or that is their job. Or tell Democrats, why don't you pay us to talk to them? Right. Because no <laughs> Republicans aren't us. paying us anymore. And and if it is true, and it is true, the GOP base are mindless, racist zombies for the most part. There is no way to message to them that will right. persuade them because you <laughs> taught them, you, you personally taught them not to listen to anyone who yeah. tells them anything they don't want to hear. Now, so the, the damage is already done and it doesn't matter how clever the messaging is. Now, I prefer Pete Buttigieg. I think he's really good at it. But th- that leaves the second question, which was, OK, let's suppose that, as I said last week, I have an armory full of great messaging for Democrats. How do I deliver that specifically Mm -hmm. to those people? They will not listen to MSNBC. There is no liberal radio. There is no liberal television. They don't crack open the New York Times and scan past David Brooks and Brett Stevens to get to Paul Krugman every morning. Mm -mm. what What do they listen to? Oh, they listen to Fox News. They listen to OAN. And they listen to Newsmax and they they listen to hate radio. And right side broadcasting. Don't forget right side broadcasting for that live coverage. Yeah. So there is no entry point in which you can start talking to them. And when they overhear, when someone points out quite rightly that some of them cling to their their Bible and their guns, the Fox News will take anything Democrats say, anything, doesn't matter. They had Hillary Clinton on the stand for how many hours, took one sentence out of context and beat it to death because they have a megaphone that they have built into these people's lives. Yep. And we do not. So it doesn't matter how clever our messaging is. We're never going to reach them. Right. Now, here's where it comes home. There are two messages in the universe that do reach these people writ large. And both of them are reflected on the same op-ed page in our local rag this week. Number one, Biden voters have a serious case of buyer's remorse from Barney, who's in there every fucking month. He's in and- there f- every four weeks to the date because he mm-hmm. knows the rules as to the, how often he can be published. Yeah. And Barney says the constant flow of illegals through our Southern border is just <laughs> criminal. Blah, 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 blah. They're being dispersed to the interior of the United States. Blah, 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 blah. Do we have laws to address this? Of course we do. Is Biden following the lead by Obama who only enforced laws he felt comfortable with? The democratic party as it's currently constituted is ruining this great country bit by bit. You made a list of the 10 most egregious ways to bring this country to its knees. It would parallel the policies of this administration, blah, 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 blah. And we do we have to wait 50 months for this? How much more damage can Biden do? I hope Biden voters are having a serious case of buyer's remorse. Stay tuned and hold your nose and hide the children. <laughs> Thank you, Barney. Barney. Now, Barney once is a, a month. Barney is once a month. Barney has already been lost to reason. Yes. Barney is is a representative of Republican voters where I live. Mm-hmm. In their tiny crushed little brains, in their tiny spongy little minds, this is how they think all the time and they only take in media that confirms this and when they don't get it immediately they write letters to the editor and then jerk off to them at home. Mm-hmm. Now the other side of this is this letter here from Stephen also in Springfield. 
Well, it finally happened. The U.S. House of Representatives somehow found a way to pass the infrastructure bill. Something like that should have happened two months ago. Something so good the country should have passed unanimously. But why didn't it? Largely because of the House infighting amongst two Democrat factions. What do I suggest? First, here you go. Hang on to your hats. This is going to be a complete surprise to all of you. First, let's give the Republican Party to the ultra-right members. The group that spreads hatred, condones lying, and moral decay. Dude, it's already, uh, it's already done. It's called the Republican Party. Second, let's give the Democratic Party to the leftist socialist extremists that want to give everything away for free. You the mean family both farm. Sides? Yep. They want to give the family farm by providing everything for free. Forget about working for a living and worrying about how things are being paid for. Third, say it with me now. Let's start another political party. Let's fill it with moderates from both parties. Moral people who know right from wrong. Hardworking people who realize there should be no such thing as free ride. Folks who put our country ahead of their personal agendas. And blah, 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 fucking blah. Those are the two dominant populations in the rural areas that Democrats are having problem messaging to. Mm -hmm. One completely batshit racist crazy Barneys and a bunch of people who have been sucking Chuck Todd's dick for too long and now really do believe that both sides are equally bad and the only thing that's going to fucking save us is a third party full of reasonable people like them. Who are center right, I center, noticed, from center. all of the agendas that he's talking about. Yeah. This is a center right country, and everybody knows and both it. of those guys are on Social Security and Medicare. Oh, sure they are. Sure they are. <laughs> and I'll guarantee you that at least one of them was a government worker for 35 right. oh, years and least. got their pension Barney that way. for sure. Yes. Yeah. But that's... Barney worked for the state. You know he did. Yes. So, Charlie Sykes, take me by the hand and show me exactly how to reach these idiots. And- you know what? I know idiots don't like being called idiots. And I know stupid people don't like being called stupid. And I know that racists don't like being called racist. So is your solution to the problem of stupidity and racism and idiocy in this country not to talk about it at all? Because that seems to be the solution is let's just mm -hmm. pretend our way out of this problem. I don't think that's going to work. So I don't, I don't, I always listen to these podcasts with an ear towards who are they lying to? Why are they mm -hmm. lying and mm -hmm. what is the consistent message across time? And I think I've listened to enough of these conservative ally podcasts to understand exactly what they're doing. They're, they're, they're justifying their seat on MSNBC, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. they're the reasonable conservatives who are our friends who need to tell us that we're all ugly and our mothers dress us funny and we should let them run the fucking party or we're all going to die uh, after a thousand years of Republican darkness. And that's the story. That's, that's who these people are. And I'm not interested in hearing about them anymore. Now, this also leads to the observation many have made, myself included, that nobody cares about the Sunday shows anymore. Yeah, that's the good news. That really is the good it's, news in my estimation. And it's and I, I've written about the Sunday shows for going on 17 years. Mm -hmm. I used to write about them every Sunday. I had a, a feature called Sunday Morning Coming Down. It's still out there sometimes. When something catches my eye, I'll write about it. But the Sunday shows are basically the worst show you could imagine. The most bland, stupid, plotless, predictable, trite, crappy dialogue, contrived Drift bullshit. Drift class. They have an exclusive with Arkansas governor and center-right Republican Asa Hutchison. Oh, honey. An exclusive. Honey, bust out the VCR. Asa <laughs> Hutchinson's on. I want to catch that later today after church. And you know what? <laughs> it's not that it's a different show every week. It's the same fucking show exactly. every week. It is yeah. reruns. It is cold tapioca pudding with shit in it every fucking Sunday. And the, and the people who run the networks know this. And the people who are on the shows know this. And Chuck Todd knows this. All the hosts know this. And there are people now doing on Twitter um, what I used to do on my, on my blog. Yeah. And I wish them luck and, and God bless them. And sometimes I just take their tweets and I embed them in a, in a post and add to them in my own inimitable way. But the, the truth is, no serious people care about them anymore. They're now just background noise. They're wallpaper because they're so fucking awful. And so they're, they're, they're the worst soap opera ever that can never be canceled. And I think it's just, I think that's exactly right. And they're so lazy. Yeah. It's oh, filler. It's, and it's, it's, it's filler. Yeah. It's, it's some un, psycho unnecessary for me. to talk about it, to cover it with no. any detail. 
Well, and um, the, and the way I know this is because I can pull any post I wrote about the Sunday shows from any point in the last 16 years and mm-hmm. repost it, and it'll be 90% accurate. And people wouldn't notice, I mean, no. that you, that it was a different show. Change the yeah, names. That's about yeah. it. You know, I'll swap out the, the crazy lady from the American Enterprise Institute with the giant um, TV screen glasses for David Brooks, but it's the same show. Mm-hmm. All saying the same thing, making the same arguments. Everyone has returned to their pre-Trump default settings, mm-hmm. and nothing... At that level of media, nothing is ever going to change. There's there's no way to push back hard enough against that to make them do anything Let's remotely see, I, approaching journalism. I agree with Rachel Bittacoffer that the way that you win elections, especially midterm and off-year elections, is to paint your opponent as too embarrassing to vote for. Mm-hmm. And if, if we have Senate races, statewide Senate races, like it looks like we're going to have with the Sean Parnells, Mm-hmm. running as the Republican side. That bodes well for Democrats. And and they did that to themselves. Mitch McConnell did this to his own party. Yes. Rupert true. Murdoch did this to his own party. And so it is really just important to paint over and over again. If you're talking to Republicans, like just take the attitude of, really? Sean mm-hmm. Parnell talking about, you know, wanting men, manly men to fight dinosaurs for women? <laughs> well, really? Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Is fighting dinosaurs because women stupider than fighting Big Bird because of vaccines? Yeah, seriously. Because Eric Bowling, you know, overshare Eric, who uh, was yeah. fired from Fox for showing yes, he was. dick pics at work and uh-huh. sexting with his coworkers. Because apparently who- conservative men don't know what the words at work mean. No. Well, and and this is also someone that Joe Scarborough personally tried to revive, tried to yeah. bring his career back. Because once you're in the club, you know, getting your ass yeah, fired from the club. He's a smart guy. You know, he's a smart he's a, guy. He's a smart guy. Come on, yeah, uh, yeah. come on, and debate. I think. And, oh, this is that I remember now. This was this was my vision of the future. You know, the uh, of Joe Scarborough's you know wingtip stamping on the human face forever. It was <laughs> it was oh because they brought they, they want to have a big debate about something or other, and it was. Eric Bowling versus Charlie Sykes, yeah, with yeah. with Joe Scarborough moderating. I'm like, uh-huh. oh, this, oh, this is what the future looks like. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. this is going to be the the aperture through which all political dialogue now flows. And basically, that's exactly what's happened. And and Eric Bowling is just fighting with Big Bird over vaccines for clicks. That's right. all he he does. This this is like the third time he's mm-hmm. gone after the Muppets for teaching children to behave responsibly. Yeah. And um, God help him. Yeah. And and in his piece this week, where he asked the Muppets to debate him, which is something he also does, he actually ran clips from Fox when he was on the Five. The last two times mm-hmm. he went after the Muppets, so he's bragging about it. Well, and, and it's just got- a way to try to be relevant. And I'm sorry, you're on Newsmax, <laughs> you know. Yeah, when you look to your left and there's Rick Santorum, mm-hmm. and you look to your right and there's uh. Oh, I'm sorry. I lost his name. Um, you know you've arrived in the anteroom of career hell. Yeah, except and, Rick Santorum's back on CNN again. So. Oh, great. Oh, great. Yeah. And But Eric Bowling does have Ted Cruz in, as his corner man. In case he gets cut during the fight, there's Ted <laughs> Cruz going to gonna you know dab fight, that fight big bird for him yeah well no yeah. just just you know clear up his cuts and wipe him down and, and give him an encouraging talk and send him out there to kick that bird's ass yeah. except that's never going to happen because eric bowling is a giant you know wuss um now do you want to jump hard to canterbury cathedral just that's, briefly yeah. because we we were shocked this week yes. canterbury cathedral has morning prayer on youtube every morning and we have enjoyed watching that we've we've had a bit of a problem because they've gone all in with cop 26 yeah and and running um really long segments of that in their youtube so you'll get up in the morning and this morning's isn't up yet but there's a two-hour video from yesterday yeah. from canterbury used, cathedral used to be 30 minutes and out now it's two hours so it's two hours because of climate cop. change yeah, and they're exactly. so excited to have the climate change conference going on I have very mixed feelings about the climate change conference. First of all, it's not a climate change conference unless Greta Thunberg is there screaming at you right. that this is a bad conference and you're not doing your job. And I'm glad she's there to tell them that. Um, it also came out this week that the largest delegation at COP26 is oil and fossil fuel lobbyists. Yeah. Larger than any other delegation mm-hmm. and larger than 
nine of the countries most affected by climate change combined. Yeah. So, you know, and and that's because it's a conference and you travel to it on the company dime. And right. but the conference needs to exclude those people. And yeah. as one of my colleagues pointed out, you know, these fossil fuel companies own the patents on so many of these new technologies for clean energy. Mm hmm. Not just so that they can make money off of them when they come in, but so that they can delay them. Right, withhold them. And keep doing what they've always done because right. that's cheaper and easier. So mm -hmm. if you want dramatic change to make climate change uh, a thing of the past and to fix it, um, you're not going to do it with the largest delegation being fossil fuel companies. No. And honestly, although as inspiring as Barack Obama can be, his general attitude of working within the system and yeah, you know, cooperating yeah. is no, 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 no. Yeah. We, we tried that. We're, we tried that done. under you yeah. and it didn't do any good at all. So, but now we uh, have to one do of the else. days for the uh, COP26 uh, conference was on women mm -hmm. and uh, their contributions to uh, the, the improvements in how we handle climate change but also the extent to which women and children are victimized by climate change. Yes. And it was a theme of the day. And, and you and I are sitting there watching this. Okay, it's a theme of the day, women, blah, blah, blah. And the um, dean of Canterbury Cathedral looked at the camera and apologized for using binary language. Yeah. <laughs> and you and I looked at one and like, it wow. is a different world. Wow. It is now a different world. Yeah. Well, from the one we grew up in. You oh, yeah. and I no, grew up in a world where that different. wasn't that wasn't considered at all. And this, so this is the yeah. equivalent in my mind to um for all mankind. Yeah. In the sense yeah. that this is the space program I was promised. Uh-huh. And and it's fiction. And this is the church that should be. This, this is, is the, the church, church that should that be. Should at be. least yeah. the, the considerations being made in the way they talk mm -hmm. is how it should be. And this is an uh 92% openly gay Dean. Oh, yeah. Who's, Talking about his cameraman and their trip to Italy to watch the ballet. His life partner. It's his <laughs> life partner. And it's clearly partner. that is the case. Yes. And yes. we shoot it in the garden and there's cats and we shoot it in the in the back garden and there's pigs feeding the pigs and the ducks. And it's, it's so much more inviting and open and cheerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's quick. You know, and again, I'm not evangelizing. Until, until COP26 came along. Until COP26. Right? And then we got to talk. <laughs> and it has, you know, it has all the stuff you, you, you know, if you are not into that at all, then it's not for you. Uh, there's a, there's a Bible thing and there's a discussion, but it's all, there's history involved. There's literature involved. There's you know, the great poets of history, the great composers of history. Um, the we, history we've of, talked of, about it before, but it is kind of fun yeah. to hear on this day in 612, somebody yeah. did something and he's buried in Can <clears throat> Canterbury Cathedral. Yeah. And, and we the know reason, where he's buried. Yeah. The reason these trees are sacred to us yeah, or special to us is this is where the guards hung their armor when they came to murder Beckett. Yeah, right. You know, like, wow, right. okay. <laughs> That's history. <laughs> that, that is living history right there. Yep, so right. but but the idea that that he would stop and say, look, I apologize for the language I'm using. Um, I'm using binary language here. Like, I know wow, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. That way to go. Good for you. Um I, I didn't read the Jennifer Rubin quote, so I'm going to take your word for it. Apparently, Jennifer Rubin owes me $5. Is that true? He owes you, she owes you $5 because her column this week on the uh, Illinois congressman. Adam Kinzinger, he's not- Adam he, Kinzinger. He's, he's being forced to, if he wants to, go and do a primary against a fellow Republican. Which he's going to lose. And, which he has, and he doesn't want that, so he wants to blame Democrats for he it. He wants and, to blame Democrats for gerrymandering, which they did. And yeah. we talked about that before. Yeah. We're happy to go fair maps- if we do it in all 50 states. Exactly. Yep. And so, um, and Adam, getting rid of Adam Kinzinger's district was an easy call. Yeah. Because the Republicans went along with that. Right. <laughs> you know, they're like, look, nobody's mm -hmm. going to miss this guy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but apparently because he's pro-democracy, we all owe him a congressional seat. Yeah. No. And the point that um, Jennifer Rubin made in her column was exactly almost word for word what you said, Drift Glass, last mm -hmm. week which is if electing Adam Kinzinger to Congress simply contributes to a Kevin McCarthy speakership, it's not progress toward democracy. No, exactly. So forget it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so we one of the things we say a lot when we're watching television, and uh, we did watch um, The Harder They Fall this yes. week. Yeah. 
um, which has gotten a lot of accolades. And I understand why it's getting accolades, but you and I both felt that the script needs a little bit of work. The yeah. costumes are amazing. The cinematography is amazing. The, the um, stunts, Music. the uh, yeah. star power of the acting is incredible. Yeah. Uh, but we just thought the script needed a little, one more run through with an eraser and it could have been yeah. half an hour shorter, I would say. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> we kept saying, yes, and now they owe Quentin Tarantino $5. $5 for Quentin um, Tarantino. <laughs> we, mm-hmm. You know, oh, they owe Steve Martin $5. Whatever it is that's going on, who who do they owe $5 to? And mm-hmm. we often say that a certain person in the political world of television owes Drift Glass $5. Yes. This which I never collect. Which, you know, he never yeah, collects it. No. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's time to talk about Joe Walsh and Toure Driftglass. Yes. Yeah. Um, I understand yeah. you have a long post up at driftglass.blogspot.com. About I wrote that. a very long post about this, and it, and I had to sit with it for a while, which is and because you know writing is getting, as I said, increasingly problematic in terms of is am I going to push this rock up this hill one more time? But this caught my attention because I juxtaposed Joe Walsh with Charlie Sykes. Joe Walsh is. You know, deadbeat Joe, shouty cracker Joe, uh, ultra right wing lunatic Joe Walsh, that guy. And Charlie Sykes, I've mentioned him a million times. You all know who, who that is. Joe Walsh and Charlie Sykes come out of the same universe. They come out of the same Petri dish, the same. They they were both hate radio hosts. Um, Charlie Sykes was on hate radio in Wisconsin for 30 years. Joe Walsh ran for Congress, won a term, lost his seat, went back to to screaming at liberals on radio. They both are products of and contributors to the conservative media that has fucked up this country, possibly irreparably, or at least for the rest of my life. So they come out of the same package and they, they, they entered the never Trump universe at pretty much the same point when they got fired, <laughs> when, <laughs> when they got kicked out of, uh, kicked out of the wealth, a wingnut welfare trough, suddenly they discovered the right was full of Republicans and that was a problem. And where do I make my next dollar? And they both landed on, well, I should probably, you know, take on Trump. Now, Joe Walsh was a Trump guy, and then he fell away from that. Charlie Sykes was earlier on with, oh, Donald Trump's problem. And why don't we run Evan McMullen, uh, which was, you know, equally stupid. Uh, Charlie Sykes has gone on to create, along with Bill Kristol, uh, basically recreate the weekly standard in uh, podcast and written form. They've spawned eight podcasts, three of which I believe are subscription only. They have a newsletter. They have built a, a pretty fair to midland size media company. And they've done this because MSNBC gives them rocket fuel every day. They have at least one of these people on almost every day, almost every hour. And the free publicity and the free exposure actually means, take it from us uh, who lack all those things, it means money and it means uh, uh, respectability. You can It opens a whole lot of doors if you're on MSNBC every day or even once. Joe Walsh got none of that. Uh, and the cringiest moment, as I've mentioned before, was Joe Walsh wheedled an invitation onto Charlie Sykes' podcast, and they both complained about the radio industry and how there's no place for them anymore and blah, 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 isn't this terrible? And Charlie Sykes says, well, maybe you should try podcasting. And Joe Walsh had already had a podcast at that point for two years, <laughs> which is, uh, like I said, I cringe when I listen to that. But here's the difference. Joe Walsh, and I say this with all caution, knowing what Glenn Beck did, Glenn Beck lied about being, you know, a born again, never Trumper, played the media like a $2 fiddle, got into the New York Times going, I was wrong, I was wrong. And then when the winds changed, he went right back and started sucking Trump's dick. So I am extremely cautious when giving any recommendation to never Trumpers, because I think most of them are scam artists who are just looking for the next paycheck. Joe Walsh on his podcast, which he has now rebranded to a, a new thing, looks like he got kicked so hard that it actually knocked some of the scales away from his eyes. Mm-hmm. And so this mm-hmm. week he had Toure on. Toure used to have a show on MSNBC. And Joe Walsh and Toure talked for, you know, 40 minutes about the fact that conservative media has been fucked up for decades, that Joe Walsh was part of the problem, that um, that racism actually exists in America, that the legacy of, of, of institutional racism dates back centuries, not just decades, not just days or weeks, that... Um, and there was a, a broad sense of agreement about the past. Joe Walsh is willing to recognize the past existed and happened and it has a continuum and led to today. And he was part of it. And he's woefully sorry for that. 
and is trying to do better. Again, take him at his word or not. But Joe Walsh invited an actual liberal, a, an activist, an African-American man on his show to talk in blunt terms about what the Republican Party used to be, why it got to be the way it was, what he and and Walsh d- agreed with 80 percent of it. Mm-hmm. And disputed the twenty percent in ways that I thought, yeah, you know, I, I would, I don't agree with them, but I get, you know, that you're still clinging to that iceberg there. Okay, that's fine. I, I'm not going to have a problem with that. That's Joe Walsh and his new podcast. Charlie Sykes has done hundreds of podcasts, hundreds of episodes, and they're all the fucking same. They're all mm-hmm. whining about liberals. They're all whining about the left. They're all talking about how liberal lefty liberal lefties are awful. Blah 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 blah. So it caught my eye. Now, other than the fact that it was on the same day that Joe Walsh's drop, is that he had a woman named Shannon Freshour on his show. And he said, this is a little bit different. I'm going to invite a centrist Democrat on my show. Like, whoa, that's pretty cool. All right. Because you don't do that. All he has on his shows are former and soon to be former Republican politicians who aren't going to become Democrats because Democrats right. are icky, but they are going to start their own third party thing. All of them are starting their own little third party grift. With a political action committee. Right. With a with a well funded political action C3 committee. With a tax deductible yep. political action and I, committee. I mean, all of them are. And these are all mm-hmm. people who are in for one term or two terms. Mm-hmm. This is David Jolly, people like that. Um, yeah. Denver Riggleman. Yep. Um, who's in for one term and out, and now he's gonna start a third party. Mm-hmm. Um, or it's it's Tom Nichols. Everyone's stupid except me. The liberals are destroying <laughs> America. I'm not gonna apologize because the left are just as bad as the right. Mm-hmm. Fuck you all. Thank you. And, and I'll go on MSNBC and say the same thing. So that, that's his guest list over and over and over and over again, all week, every week. And this woman comes on. She's a centrist Democrat. And they're talking. They're going back. And forth. She's from the Midwest. She's from Ohio. Oh. And I'm like, I, I don't never heard of her before. Who is this woman? So I look it up, and she's the one who ran against Jim Jordan in Ohio 4th. In Ohio 4th. I got creamed because it's, it's a gerrymandered district. Mm-hmm. She didn't stand much of a chance. Heavily she, gerrymandered. Yeah, yes. Ha, has never held political office in her life. Uh, is a paralegal, apparently, has a master's degree. That's and, just a sacrificial lamb. Right. I mean, but that's all honestly, that is. She, she did what we respected Betsy Dirksen yes. for doing, which right. was step into the arena. I'm a conservative citizen. This case, she's trying to take down a monster. She steps into the arena. She tries her best and she loses. Mm-hmm. Cool. That's good why I have her. It's important yeah. to run. That's good. And so they start talking. And Charlie Sykes wants to know why Democrats suck at, at messaging to rural voters. And she starts in with, well, you know, 30 years of right-wing radio and blah, 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 blah. And then, and Charlie Sykes, you can just hear his every <laughs> hole puckering up going. And and he tries to interrupt her once and then he cuts her off and says, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've talked about it on this, this, on this podcast many times, many times. I want to talk about how Democrats fail to do what they're supposed to do. Why are Democrats so bad at messaging? Why do Democrats suck at talking to people? Why have Democrats written off the rural, rural populations in this country? And she took the cue and then went with, well, you know, uh, P- Nancy Pelosi kind of sucks. And, you know, Chuck Schumer's kind of kind of a fool. And, you know, uh, the, the, the real, the, the true heart of the Democratic Party is, is, uh, is a guy named uh, Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema. That's, that's the real Democratic Party. Uh, these, these people, you know, Sanders from Vermont and Ocasio-Cortez from New York, they're just, you know, flaky outliers, the real heart and soul of the party. Like, oh, I get it. I get it. First of all, she thought she was on a different podcast <laughs> and uh-huh. she thought she could actually talk about, no, the reason rural voters are fucked in the head is because they listen to you, Charlie Sykes, for 30 fucking years. 30 years. And, exactly. and that is, and that, and you can just compare and contrast. Joe Walsh and Trey are perfectly willing to talk about how things got to be this way and Joe Walsh's participation in it. Charlie Sykes will have none of that on his mm-hmm. show. He does mm-hmm. not acknowledge the past ever happened. All he wants to talk about is how Democrats are failing to talk to rural voters and why Democrats suck at doing politics. And once she figured that out, she was, she was down with the program. And now Charlie Sykes has in his back pocket from now until the end of time, even a centrist Democrat agrees that Democrats suck at everything. <laughs> you know, centrist Democrats like Shannon Freshour, who I spoke to just the other day, agrees that Ocasio-Cortez and Sanders, they're not the party. The real party is Joe Manchin. And that's all he wanted from this. That is the that is the drop of elixir he squeezed from this woman. And she got her airtime. Mm-hmm. Of course, I'd never heard of her before. She's never run for anything but this. And she lost. She's never held a political office. So why, of the 80 million Democrats in this country, did Charlie Sykes give her the microphone? Like, oh, here's why. Because he wants that quote. Yep. He wants centrist Democrats agree with Charlie Sykes. 
Now, does she have a book out or anything, or is she just looking for a job elsewhere? Not that I know of. Uh -huh. She's from Ohio. She's a Midwesterner in Ohio. And it's a change of pace for me because yeah. we're, we're asking. Now, what Joe Walsh figured out was sitting in his room by himself talking to himself wasn't working. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. nobody wants to hear that. So he has well, guests and on. And I appreciate his honesty. I do appreciate yeah. the fact that he's saying what Stuart Steven said. Yeah. You know, it was all live. I would have disagreed with you five years ago, but I know now yeah. that you're right, that this is a racist, you know, know nothing party. Yes. And, and I, I was I part of it. That. And I take responsibility for that, you know. Recognizing yeah. that he could reverse himself tomorrow. I mean, this is why I, I will trust him in five years. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, when mm -hmm. he's done this, when he's done the hard scut work of working the trenches, knocking doors, trying to get Democrats elected. Okay. I'll, I'll give him, I'll give him a bite. Because there are plenty of, of, of Republicans who quit the party years before Trump ever showed up who are in our regular orbit. And that's fine. But right. I don't trust any of these people until they put in the time. But the fact that he had an actual liberal on his show mm -hmm. is willing to mm -hmm. engage him and agree with him and acknowledge what he was saying was true is such a stark difference than the Charlie Sykes pablum that he pumps out on his very large site. We, this is newsletter and multiple podcasts, et cetera. Um, and yet these two guys came out of the same Petri dish, like I said. Mm -hmm. They came out of the mm -hmm. same universe. And one of them figured out there's money to be made on MSNBC. Shit talking MSNBC when you're not on the air. I mean, Sykes talks about, you know, you'll never hear this on MSNBC. You know how those people are. <laughs> oh, dude, these people fed you and clothed you when your own party cooked. Oh, well, it doesn't yeah. matter. But yep. Aunt Joe Walsh is now trying to do something different. And I, I – Give him, you know, I salute him. If if he wants to come on this podcast, we'll have him. If he wants to put so us on his class, podcast, we'll go. Drift glass. Yeah. Speaking of petri dishes. Yeah. Oh God. Let's go. What Let's is go. this? What is this Austin University Barry Weiss jam thing going on the, with Andrew Sullivan? The Phrenological University of Austin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I. I just. I. It is a bunch of. It's another scam. I it's, can't. It's, they don't issue degrees. No, they're not a. No, this is master class for canceled people. Oh, it is, and they're not canceled. They're and they're not, not fucking canceled. canceled. <laughs> Andrew Sullivan has a, a huge audience, and he yeah. can go on the, the on the 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 real time show anytime he wants. Yes, Barry Weiss is not canceled. She's no longer welcome at the New York Times, but neither am I. You know, yeah. I, I her her uh, her Twitter account wasn't canceled for calling someone trash. Mine was. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to invite me to be a guest lecturer at your college, I'd be happy to come. What does it pay? But this is another, let's scrape together all the assholes and losers we can think of on the right who think that cancel culture is a thing and it's a terrible thing. And maybe the worst problem in the history of problems. I'm waiting for Glenn Greenwald to show up and be a guest lecturer there. And let's call it a university. And everybody, every one of these people has name value and name recognition and a big, deep pocket friends in the media. I'm sure it'll be a roaring success um, until people figure out that it's just a bunch of jerk offs whining about something that isn't really a problem, except, you know, it sounds like it's a problem. And there's an audience for that. Believe me, having listened <laughs> to all of the bitching about how this, this epidemic of cancel culture is ruining America for people that don't want to talk about what the real problems are, I'm sure they'll do fine for a while. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, as somebody called it Substack University, I'm like, yep, yep, that's what it yep. is. And this is, as as we mentioned on the Twitter machine, when you have Prager University as your safety school. As your safety. You know. <laughs> pra Dennis Prager, who doesn't remember the 80s at all. No, no. When it comes to AIDS and how well, people with AIDS and gay people were treated in the 1980s. Here's the actual quote. Uh, there's some ellipses in here because why, uh -huh. why quote everything this idiot says? During the AIDS crisis, can you imagine if gay men and intravenous drug users, had they been pariahs the way non-vaccinated people are? But it would have been inconceivable. And I'm like, I don't know if you are so far gone, you actually don't remember the 80s and 90s, which you vigorously participated in. Or if you just assume that people who listen to Dennis Prager are so fucking stupid, they don't remember. Or, or. Let's just lie. There's nobody's yeah. going to call Let's us on it. Let's just lie. Nobody's going to call me matter. out. I'm sitting here Make on Fox. Yeah. 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 You know, Ronald Reagan didn't mention the AIDS crisis. No, he wouldn't talk about it. He wouldn't right. talk about it. This Talk about turning your back on a population. I, You know, yeah. I had gay friends. I had I was involved in Mensa groups where they participated and they were scared to death. They were being, Absolutely. they were being, 
I had uh, one gentleman at my home for a meeting who was trying to figure out a way to not be gay anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and is there a way I can sort of, you know, not be myself anymore because it's a death sentence. I, right. I was there when I, this, I'm not, a, I'm an activist. I didn't do anything more than just try to lend a sympathetic ear. I had no expertise in the matter, but I, I remember this is called grid, you know, gay related immunodeficiency. Right. Right. And right. it was horrifying. And the fact that Dennis Prager just brushes it off. Yeah. Like, you know, because the like, real, the real people who are victimized are people who refuse to get vaccinated. Right. Yeah. The, the real victims here are the, are the German camp guards, <laughs> You know, and I'm like this, and it's so horrifying that Dennis Prager that someone didn't come and yank his microphone away from him and march him off to a, a home uh -huh. where where the doors lock on the outside and say you can never <laughs> ever talk on a microphone, on a microphone ever again. again. <laughs> but you know, okay, free hey, speech. Hey, we have hey. a request from a listener, Dirk. Oh yes, this we do. This is going to be a long podcast, by the way. <clears throat> hey, <we're clears throat> a, request, a request from a listener uh, we do. who has who asks you, Dirk Glass, right? It's been five minutes commenting on the following tweet by Matthew Dowd. And here's the quote from Matthew Dowd. Mm -hmm. Let us put leaders in power who pursue knowledge and truth, who welcome science and information that's instrumental in advancing our world, and who write books or read books and not those who want to burn books. Okay. First, if the first words in your sentence are let us instead of let's, it means you are being preached to by a windbag. So you should know that. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's just, you know, scripture 101. Let us begin. No, 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 no. You're, doing, you're way too self-righteous. Second, I personally am 100% anti-book burning, except in the case of the day after tomorrow apocalyptic polar ice cap movie, in which case the, the, the earth suddenly freezes over. You're stuck in a library. There's nothing left to burn. Temperature outside has dropped to, you know, 120 below zero. And you have to burn books to stay alive. And then so, you go for... All of the books that Mark Levin wrote. You know what? Ayn Rand makes great Tinder. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all I'm saying. Actually, no, it burns like a log. It's it's a thousand pages long. Yeah, so that's your right. log. But, you know, Mark Levin stuff, you know, would go up pretty quick. And if it's necessary to stay alive, to huddle around a fire. Uh, Made of protect, Mark Levin books, that's okay. I, I no one ever it. read I, them anyway. They're I, just on I your shelf as a talisman against right. liberalism. So whatever. I don't I don't approve of doing it during during normal weather, <laughs> but during yeah. uh, a polar vortex apocalypse, okay, you're you're forgiven. Third, we should consider why tyrants and demagogues and Republicans are so into burning books. Why do they love? Why is that the first fucking target? Ban them, burn them, get them out of libraries, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's because they're afraid of them. They're afraid of what's in those books. They're afraid of the ideas in those books. They're afraid of the history that's in those books. They don't want to talk about slavery and institutional racism in this country. So let's just write them out of history. Let's burn those books. They're afraid that people might learn something about them that would threaten their position or ideology or hold on power. That people might start questioning, why the fuck am I listening to this asshole? Look, look what he did. Look what his beliefs are. This is monstrous. So now let's consider why Matthew Dowd deleted 145,000 tweets from his Twitter archive and immediately blocks anyone who mentions anything that he was saying or doing over the past 13 years. He burned years. the Twitter book, is what you're saying. <laughs> he burned his Twitter book. He burned it. And he looks at you like you're the dumbass uh, for questioning why he would ever do such a thing. It's because like a tyrant or a demagogue or an ideologue, Matthew Dowd does not want you asking him questions about what he's been doing for the past 13 years. Because his Twitter archive was full of shit that would disqualify him from holding public office. Particularly Democratic public office because yeah. he, oh, yeah. he was not a Hillary Clinton voter. And no. He told people not to vote for Hillary Clinton. He told people her. both sides are equally bad. Both sides are equally terrible. It, Trump, Trump is bad. Hillary's bad. <laughs> the corrupt yep. duopoly must be defeated. And so it's hilarious. Again, personally, 100% against burning books, but it's hilarious that this asshole that dumped his entire Twitter archive because he was afraid people would read it mm -hmm. is now like, mm -hmm. you know, we should elect leaders who don't want to burn books mm -hmm. and destroy the past. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, sure, right. I'm sure I'm I'm sure. sure as you stood in front of the mirror holding a hairbrush, which you don't really need, neither do I, practicing this speech, it sounded good when you were saying it and it sounded great on Twitter. And I'm sure a thousand people said, Democrats should listen. To what Matthew Dowd's saying, because he's making a whole lot of sense. Like, okay, that's fine. Go for it. I hope I uh, didn't exceed my five minutes there. We're good. Okay. It's just going to be a long podcast this week. 
I'm sorry. Please give my uh, apology to or the sound editor who uh, who I'm married he's to. He's talking to you right now. He's yeah. talking to you right now. So <laughs> all of you out there who are like, why does the over talk and under talk, et cetera, why don't you let Blue Gal – Blue Gal controls everything that goes in this You can podcast. delete anything Drift Class if says. The, the but, mountain of hot David Brook takes. But that, Drift Class is the talent in the trailer. So I know that's why you come is to hear him rant. So oh, we, please. you leave it I, all in. I come and to this podcast besides, to hear my I wife talk. I love Drift Class. You know I, I love, love I love my wife. And I love listening to her talk. I mean, especially when you talk about matters philosophical, historical, liturgical, et cetera. I just, I'm in awe of how smart you are. We both have our passions. Yes, we do. And fortunately for our marriage, one of our passions is each other. <laughs> yes. Hey, hey. What, what was it? Last night we were watching the uh, finale of... Uh, for All Mankind. For All Mankind uh, mm-hmm. on Apple TV, the space show. Yes. And uh, there's a... No spoilers, but there's a couple having marital problems. And I looked at you and I said, you know... You and I would never have this problem because we never stop talking to each other right. <laughs> ever. <laughs> I'm sure it annoys the kids, but no, we don't. No, it's it, it's funny because mm-hmm. these people had a very bad, this couple had a very, very bad miscommunication in their marriage because they had long separations because one of them's in space. I mean, mm-hmm. that's that's not a spoiler. Uh, it's and The astronaut lifestyle does not lead to... <laughs> a lot of communication <laughs> no there's a long long history of alcoholism depression and divorce among the astronaut corps yeah in yeah. the real world so, yeah so, so by the way but i looked at you and said we never stop talking to each other so that's not a problem for us <laughs> this is this is breaking news today that i'm going to add to our news list it'll just take a second they're launching the replacement to the hubble telescope sometime next week or two i think oh wow to that, that will blow our minds it will blow our minds so and yeah, one a, of our satellites is looking now at the uh, red eye storm of Jupiter. Mm-hmm. So that's something to Google and take a look at. Yeah. I just, every time I get really down about my species, and it's pretty frequently these days, I look around and look at what NASA's doing. Go, oh, you're putting up a replacement to Hubble to look deeper into the universe and and solve even more of the mysteries and look at more of the beauty that's around us all all, all the time that we never see. Well, that's fucking awesome. I would like yeah. to contribute to that. Oh, I do? That's tax dollars. That's that's big government at work. And I couldn't be happier. Speaking of big government and infrastructure. The Biden this, continues. <laughs> yes. This week, the House passed the one point two trillion dollar infrastructure bill to improve the country's roads, bridges, pipes, ports and Internet connections, which Biden hailed as a monumental step forward for the nation. Finally, infrastructure week, Biden told reporters. I'm so happy to say that infrastructure week. Job creation came roaring back in October as 531,000 people who were added to the workforce. Leisure and hospitality led job creation, followed by professional and business services and manufacturing. Hell yeah. Nearly 1 million kids ages 5 to 11 will have received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccines by their first week of eligibility. This represents about 3% of eligible kids, with an additional 700,000 having appointments scheduled in the coming days. Pfizer's experimental antiviral pill appears to work very well at keeping people who are at high risk of severe COVID-19 from being admitted to the hospital and dying, according to the drug's maker, Pfizer. Uh, The drug was 89% effective compared with a placebo at preventing hospitalization or death in patients with COVID-19 who are at high risk of severe complications. The company says it plans to ask the FDA to authorize the drug for emergency use. The Biden administration will invest an additional $785 million to combat the spread of the coronavirus in communities hit hardest by the pandemic and those at the highest risk of death and disease. You know what? You know what we just did there, you and me? What? We just messaged the shit out of the Biden administration. <laughs> so. You're welcome. You're welcome. Exactly. Uh, unfortunately, people are dying from COVID-19 at a rate three times higher in counties where Trump won at least 60 percent of the vote than in counties where Biden won a similar percentage. That is due to vaccination rates. Yep. Uh, Ted Cruz accused Sesame Street's Big Bird of, quote, government propaganda after the Muppet tweeted he'd been vaccinated against COVID-19. Big Bird, who's been on TV since 1969, is officially six years old and became eligible for the vaccine after the FDA authorized the Pfizer vaccine for kids ages 5 to 11. 
And he has, Big Bird has been pushing getting vaccinated against disease for mm-hmm. a much longer time than Ted Cruz has been in the U.S. Senate. Yeah, Ted Cruz was off committing the Zodiac murders <laughs> back when Big Bird was urging people to get vaccinated against the measles. So right. shut up, Ted. Right. The House Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol riot issued new subpoenas to 10 former Trump White House officials, including Kayleigh McEnany and Stephen Miller. I did like what Stephen Colbert said or something about he can only be summoned by sacrificing a goat. Yeah, he's he's just. Yeah, I want that to be the face people remember other than Trump's of this administration. Yeah, at least 13 of Trump's senior aides campaigned illegally for his reelection in violation of the Hatch Act which is a law designed to prevent federal employees from abusing the power of their offices on behalf of candidates. The Office of Special Counsel reported uh, the Office of Special Counsel report described a willful disregard for the law by senior Trump administration officials who quote chose to use their official authority not for legitimate functions of the government. Surprise, surprise. The Republican convention was held at the White House. Right. There will never live that down in history. They will never live that down. Nancy Pelosi called for investigations by the House Ethics Committee and law enforcement into Representative Paul Gosar for posting a video that depicts him killing Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and swinging two swords at Biden. Now, I would like to anime Paul Gosar, but one of us has been banned from Twitter already on this podcast, and that's enough. I should get on Twitter long enough to call him trash and then get myself banned again. (laughs) Get yourself banned. You know who else got banned twice is that Mm -hmm. Emerald Robinson from Newsmax. Really? Yeah, she got banned and got back on and immediately started tweeting her sub stack, which contained vaccine disinformation and got kicked off permanently. You know who else would get banned from from Twitter for telling the truth. Jesus. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. That's what Emerald Robinson thinks. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trump says he will probably wait until after the 2022 midterm elections to announce whether he will run for president in 2024. This effectively freezes the field for the time being. Mm-hmm. 65% of Americans support the bipartisan infrastructure deal, which Congress passed last week. 62% of Americans support the social safety net and climate bill also known as Build Back Better. Mm -hmm. Um, You want to talk about WMAY? Oh, just this caller. We have a local AM radio station, WMAY, which has a liberal on in the afternoon, Mm -hmm. Jim Leach. Mm -hmm. And he takes calls from right-wingers and mushes them into pulp. It's it's the programming note, you know. (laughs) This is how it works. Mm -hmm. Uh, But someone phoned in, and and the topic was Jim Leach was talking about how our congressman, Rodney Davis, Republican of Illinois, voted against the bipartisan infrastructure deal. But but just one second. Uh, I have heard this excuse repeated on social media and on Facebook. This is apparently a talking point that's been distributed through whatever weird neural network they have. The talking point is that the reason Rodney Davis voted against the bipartisan infrastructure bill is if that bill passes... It greases the skids for the Build Back Better bill, which will destroy America. Mm -hmm. Destroy. So the point was to block bill number one. So bill number two will not get passed and destroy America. Well, there there are $2 billion in the infrastructure bill for the greasing of skids. So if that's a thing (laughs) that that needs doing. Um, and Jim Leach just had a field day with the destroy yeah. America part of the call. Mm-hmm. But also, again, this caller's on Medicare and Social Security. This mm-hmm. caller would really like to stay in his home instead of going to a Medicaid funded uh, nursing home. I am yeah. sure of it. The Build Back Better plan will make his the his remaining years better, more comfortable and healthier and It just it is just astonishing that it is better for him in his mind, this caller, to absorb talking points from Kevin McCarthy or wherever than actually vote for something and support people who vote for something that's going to make his life better. Well, yeah. And as we've hammered home over and over again on this podcast today and and going back years, this guy's brain was broken long ago. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. I'm sure he believes that Barack Obama was born in Kenya. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he mm -hmm. believes Barack Obama was never the legitimate president. Yeah. I'm sure he believes Hillary Clinton, you know, eats babies. I'm sure he believes Bill Clinton had people assassinated and sold drugs. Mm -hmm. This is a long standing problem. And this is, this is the end result of, an, of the Republican infrastructure project of building a political infrastructure, an indestructible political infrastructure that led us to this point. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, Jim Leach just said, you're a moron, you're foolish, one bill has nothing to do with the other. Well, They're and destroy America with a, was a part, just like, you know, are, are you kidding me? What what part of lowering prescription drug prices is going to destroy America? Yeah, well, nah. and, and I like Jim, and I know Jim, and mm -hmm. Jim is talking you know they're they're talking past each other which you know um this and the point being that everything will destroy america yeah if, right if, the, if all you have on as a lever for these people is fear mm -hmm. the, the fear that they have has to be escalated constantly to match the actual good stuff that democrats are trying to do mm -hmm. so bill clinton had to be a drug abusing assassin right and barack obama had to be a kenyan communist mm -hmm. and joe biden has to be joe stalin Right. And it doesn't matter. Facts don't fucking matter a thing to these people. And that's why calling into radio shows is just them. And I'm sure after that, he, he you know, called his friends. You hear me? Did you hear me? I, I owned them libs. I told them I was four. I told him he had to cut me off. I was making so much goddamn good sense. He had to cut me right off. But I was making all kinds of sense. I'll see you down at uh, the diner later and we'll interview uh, with that New York Times fella who wants to hear about diners and Trump. We'll tell him all about that stuff. <laughs> Hey, each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty Drift Class is magic. Magic, I have to tell you, is so much like our own Olive. Oh, the yeah. Parkour Kitty. Yeah. Um, the owner of uh, Magic said, it's impossible to stop myself from calling him Magic Man. <laughs> he was described as a shy boy, the runt of his litter. Ha, he's the least shy of our four feline kids. We had a few minor earthquakes lately when the older cats dove for cover. Not magic. Magic didn't bat an eye. Magic just stayed out there because, you know, magic's a magic man. He can just jump on the ceiling mm -hmm. and uh, escape all that earthquake nonsense. You told the earthquakes, is that all you got? Is that, is all, that you all you got? got? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's 18 months old. He is a compact mass of matter and energy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sounds very much like our Olive. He's an all oh, black yeah. kitty. You've got to go see him. Magic is just a terrific kitty. And of course, Magic Man eats freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store direct, your animals will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can send your internet kitty, dog, or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Hashtag fire to joy. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information, merch, you know, it's not too late to order a uh, professional left bumper sticker or t-shirt for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's all there at proleftpod.com. Come on, you Soroses. Get out there and get that <laughs> stuff. We love our Soroses. <laughs> <laughs> please share our show on social media. And if you love this podcast, please ask someone else to listen too. And thank you for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties know full well that nobody debates the Muppets and lives to tell about it. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. 
Professional F podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.